Gary and Maurice, if you guys want to join me up here, man, we will get this thing going. Glory to God. So, for those of you who don't know, we got Gary Venturella and we got Maurice Cabarac. Hallelujah. Let's give them a big hand for sticking themselves up here. <laughs> sticking themselves in the fire. <laughs> Glory to God. So, just to give everybody a little bit of background, um, you know, Gary uh, and Shelly, his wife right there, we've... Uh, We've been friends um, since March of 2012 when we first came into the building. So I think the week after we, we got into this building, they came wandering in the door. Um, they were lost. <laughs> they were lost. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And they, uh, man, they had no idea they weren't going to be able to get rid of me, you know? <laughs> And so here we are, and they've been great friends to Becky and I and just to the, 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 fe the fellowship here. Um, they do a Bible study down in uh, New Orleans in Lakeview on uh, the first and third Monday. So if you're ever looking for a group in, in New Orleans, man, drop by first and third Monday. Um, you'll be blessed. Then we got uh, Maurice Cabarac over here to the left. And these guys actually knew each other before they, they realized they were both in the, the church here. Um, so they go, they go way back, um, their families and, and everything. Um, but Maurice, I, I can't remember exactly which month it was, but right around that same time, like March, March or April, uh, Maurice and his wife Marie back there, hi Marie, um, they, they come walking through the door also, and uh, been here ever since, and been great friends to Becky and I, and to the fellowship, and just uh, have been, just played a huge role in, in my life, and, and my walk with God, and, and just encouraging me, and sharing truth with me, and, and hugging me, and laughing with me, and crying with me, and, 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 and all those things. So, man, I'm so thankful for these guys, and it's just an honor to sit up here um, with them and, and, and talk the gospel. Hallelujah. So we'll just pray real quick. Father, we just thank you for your spirit. We just thank you that, uh, man, we're not trying to get you to come down here, that you're here in us and in the midst of us, that no matter where we go, there you are. I thank you, Father, that, uh, man, we can just give utterance to uh, the, the spirit of truth today and that people can be edified, they can be encouraged, they can uh, experience freedom, they can experience peace, love, joy. Um, and we just thank you, Lord, for your love for, for everybody here and that, uh, man, you'll bring forth questions and answers in a way that, uh, man, can minister to the hearts of people. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Um, so we, we have some questions from, from people online, but um, I always like to start off with, with the people here and, and just give everybody a chance here to either ask a question or share something um, that's blessed you or just really anything that, that's on your heart. If you feel uh, you got something to share, maybe you, you've experienced a, a great victory, you've uh, got a revelation, man, you just feel touched by God, whatever it might be. Um, or if you have a question, feel free. Phil. Hello. Um, this came up last weekend for me, and I mentioned it to you earlier, but it's about the authority of Christ. So my, my question is, what is that authority, and how did he come by it? You're starting with an easy one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dad, Dad, were we getting a feed on Phil's question there? Was the mic mic'd? It wasn't very strong. It wasn't very strong. Right. Okay. Can you turn okay. that mic up then? Phil, can you just talk in that again real quick? Okay. All right, my question is... There you go. All right. What is the authority of Christ, the Son of Man, and how did he come by it? I think it's off. They keep passing the mic. Are you all with me? Well, it's not on. 
I'm not, I'm not on. Now I'm on. Okay. Phil, you know, uh, the way I see the authority of God is that he is the one who speaks things into existence that are not, not as though they were. And somehow or another, in his son, in Jesus, he has spoken a word to us and about us that can cause that which is in his heart about us to come to fruition. He has authority to speak his word, which is uh, the truth about who he is, and work that into our lives. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in, uh, in life, you know, very tumultuous things. You know, you look at uh, people in East Africa and they're starving to death. You look at people over here and they're driving around in brand new SUVs. And you look at that and you say, well, where's the authority? How come these people are rich and these people are poor? And, uh, but, but there is something in God that is trying to communicate something to all of us about himself that what is in him might exist in us. And that is his authority and his ability to do it is, is great and it's found in his son. Does that make sense that, that you, you know, we, we want to see Jesus do something. We want to see Jesus, uh, you know, change a circumstance. And we think that that's what authority is. But that's not what authority is. He sees something about you as an individual, and he wants to speak his life into your life. And, and he has the authority and the power to do that very thing. To follow up, when, when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God, I was looking at the Greek on that, and the Greek says when, when the word kingdom is not an actual physical kingdom. It is the authority or the right to rule over a kingdom. And to me, obviously when Jesus said all authority has been given to me, by the Father, obviously. We have that same authority to rule over the kingdom of darkness. Um, that's the kingdom that's always trying to get us to think and act and believe carnally. Before Jesus, we didn't have the authority. We were kind of at the mercy of that kingdom. But since Jesus, we've been given the same authority as him to rule over the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. So to me, that's kind of what that authority speaks of. Glory to God. Um, and yeah, that's a loaded question. We could sit here for months and years just trying to unpack that. So I don't know that we'll, we can hit it from every, every um, direction. But um, yeah, it's like, it's like what, what Mo and uh, Gary said, all authority has been given to me, whether in heaven and earth. And so if I look at the authority of the Son of Man, it's that um, Jesus has dominion over this earthly realm, and he also has dominion in the heavenly realm. All authority has been given back unto the Christ. Um, and so he has authority over the sin and death that found a way into this earth, right? And he has a lordship over that and over everything. So the authority to establish uh, the life of God has been given to Jesus because it, it requires a man to establish the life of God in the earth because God gave dominion over the earth to a human being, right? And so in order for God to be able to bring forth his life in the earth and to establish lordship um, in the earth, he needed a human being to do that. And the only way that could happen is if that authority was given from God. Well, the only way you can receive that authority is as a gift. And so basically what that meant is that Jesus, as a human being, rested in God to give him authority. And how did God give him authority? God took him and sat him at the right hand, right? Above every principality and power. He sat him above every system of rule and governance in this world. He sat him above the kingdom of darkness, Right? He absorbed the darkness and death into himself, and he was raised up from it and sat above it. So he received authority from the Father. Right? Right. And the authority he received from the Father was because he rested in the Father. 
And now he's got authority over all things, whether in heaven and earth, to bring about God's eternal purpose for man and earth, right? Which is that we could be clothed in glory and immortality, we could have eternal life, and the earth could also be baptized in glory and immortality. Then we could live here for all time with God, right? Does that make sense? He's got authority over the sin and death in this earth. He reigns over it. The sin and death in this earth does not have authority over him. He has authority over it. How do we know? We see how he conquered it in the cross and in the resurrection and ascension. Right? So the authority he has is over the kingdom of darkness. And what he's going to do with that authority is he's going to establish the kingdom of light in the earth and in human beings, and nothing can stop it. Right? And he received that authority from the Father. When he, hanging naked on a cross didn't lift one finger to establish his own authority. Right. He didn't lift one finger to establish his own authority. He afflicted his soul and did no work. And he cried out to the Father, Abba, into your hands I commit my life. And so when he did that, the Father could come and take him and seat him at his right hand, the position of authority. And so now he, as a man, has authority over all things, whether in heaven and earth, to bring about God's life and God's eternal purpose, which is for heaven and earth to be joined together as one and for every remnant of sin and death to be consumed or swallowed up by light and life. That's the authority that's been given to him. Right? Amen. Does that make any sense? And that's kind of why Jesus prayed he, when he taught him to pray the Our Father. Yeah. Thy kingdom come... Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? That's the prayer he taught them to pray. Right? Does anybody, does anybody want to add anything to that um, in the audience? You don't just have to have a question. You can have a, a statement. Well, talk about the uh, free will of man and the sovereignty of God now. The free will of man and the sovereignty of God. Keeping it light. <laughs> You want to do this backwards now? I'll start off and we'll work that. Yeah, you so you're always in the middle? Yeah, Is that yeah, how it goes? <laughs> the sovereignty of God. Man, that's, that's a loaded question. Um, the sovereignty of God is not that God is in control of everything and making everything that happens happen. That's not the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is that he has chosen the manner in which man will have life, right? And he's elected that the manner in which man will have life is to receive it as a gift through his grace. That's his sovereignty, right? And um, his sovereignty involves, he, when it was the Father, Son, and Spirit, they were able to dream up between themselves what they wanted for their life with man. And so he had the ability to decide, I want man to be a co-heir. And so he didn't want a servant, he wanted a co-heir. Right? He didn't want a lesser being. He wanted a being that could have equality with him, that could share in his exact same life. That's part of his sovereignty. Right? He wasn't going to be happy with just a dog outside in the yard. He wanted somebody that could live in the house with him and that could dwell in the house with him and that could be um, an heir with him in his kingdom and his life. Okay? So he first, as, as a sovereign, he had a dream for his life. Right? And so he determined what the dream he had for his life was. And part of that was that heaven and earth would become one. And so he set man with dominion over the earth. And in his sovereignty, he said that man will partake of life by me giving it to them as a free gift. By me serving them with life. Okay? So that's the sovereignty of God. He's elected that the way in which man will have life is grace. And if you read Romans 9, that's what it talks about there. Election. We've confused election with God elects some people and not other people. No, 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 no. The Bible says Jesus was the lamb that took away the sin of the world. Behold, it, John says that God so loved the world, not just the elect. Okay? So when we, we think of the sovereignty of God in terms of he elects some for salvation and some for death, and that's his sovereignty, or we think of it in terms of God's in control of everything here, making everything that happens, happens. Listen, that's not the sovereignty of God. And there's just a real easy statement to say about that. When's the last time you committed a sin? 
Now, we don't, need to, we don't feel any shame about this, but this is just the easiest way to demonstrate this point. How many of you think God's the one who made you commit that sin? I thought he was sovereign. Did, did God make Adam eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Didn't God try to influence Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So, so Paul kind of said it this way in Ephesians. We were predestined in Christ that we might stand before him, set apart unto his spirit and not the spirit of the world, that we could stand face to face with him and experience love instead of fear. That's the sovereignty of God, right? He predestined that man would be found in Christ. Man will be found in Christ, okay? It's got nothing to do with him making everything that happens, happens, okay? He's not in control like that because he created man to be co-heirs, right? So if we want to use the language free will, free will doesn't mean absent of influence. It means in spite of being influenced, I still have the ability to accept or reject. Right? So God comes to influence the hearts of people with the truth that is Christ. And we have the ability to receive that influence or to reject it. We can soften our hearts to it or we can harden our hearts to it. Okay? So Adam, if we want to say it that way, had free will. Right? And God wanted to influence Adam to eat from the tree of life. And in eating from the tree of life, join heaven and earth together as one. And that he would then be clothed in immortality. But Adam also was influenced by something else. And he went and ate from the tree of death instead. God didn't make Adam eat from the tree of death. But in God's sovereignty, even though Adam ate from the tree of death, and now all of a sudden man wasn't in Christ, that wasn't going to keep God from bringing forth man in Christ. He sends Christ as a man now and restores it all back. Do you see? So in God's sovereignty in deciding that he predestined us in Christ, nothing can keep that from happening. Right? Th does that make sense? Does everybody see that? God doesn't make tornadoes happen. He doesn't make hurricanes happen. He doesn't make um, volcanic eruptions happen. He doesn't make deaths happen. He doesn't make diseases happen. He doesn't make any of those things happen. And if we confuse those things happening with the sovereignty of God, then we're, we've roamed way outside of the Scriptures. Right? The Bible says that by one man, Adam, death entered the world. It doesn't say by the sovereignty of God, death entered the world. By one man, Adam. I believe it's Jeremiah that goes on to say the earth was defiled by man. So when Adam brought death into the world, Paul says the earth groans in travail. Right? Desiring for life to be born in it. Desiring to be set free from the death. So Adam brought sin and death into the world, and that corrupted creation. God didn't corrupt creation. Once sin and death entered the earth and corrupted creation, guess what's going to happen? Things like hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes. Right? When you have human beings that aren't necessarily filled with the sun, they can do things, right, that aren't life. That's not God making them do it, okay? And so that's a very perverted way of man trying to blame God. That's what I call the Adam mind, right? Where when God came to Adam and said, did you eat from the tree? What did Adam say? It's you and that woman you gave me. Okay, so the Adam mind has infiltrated the church. And so the Adam mind looks at the death and darkness in the earth it doesn't see it as what man brought into the earth, but we say, it's you and that woman you gave me. <laughs> see, we blame God. And, and, and it's like uh, what God asked Job, will you make me unrighteous to make yourself seem righteous? Will you blame me for what's happening so you can make yourself seem righteous? And then God says, let me question you to see if what you believe is true. Were you there? Here, 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 here. Do you see? And so what happens is, is that many times man, if they're functioning from the mind of Adam, they're living from self-justification. We try to bring ourselves peace when we see calamity that we don't understand by blaming God. And so then we come up with this whole doctrine of the sovereignty of God. We don't know why God took our brother. You see? Listen, guys, I, and, and just so everybody knows, because I know I, I offend some people sometimes when I do that. Um, 
I'm also making fun of myself. I've also done that. And so let us not define ourselves by things we've said or done. Let us just realize what has come from God and what hasn't. Okay? We say things sometimes out of confusion and just wanting to bring peace. And many times the things we say when we try to bring ourselves peace don't come from God. Right? And our inability to understand, we're not just comfortable walking with the one who is understanding. We create our own doctrines to try to explain things we don't understand. And then we call them the gospel truth. I think the word sovereign in reference to God is only used one time in the whole Bible, actually. I'm just pointing that out. How many of you realize that's been a staple taught in the church? Go look it up, though, in the Bible and try to find it. Just do a search. Sovereignty. See how many times it comes up in the Bible. You might be lucky to find it come up one time. All right? That doesn't mean that God doesn't have sovereignty, but in the realm we've tried to teach it, you don't find it in the Bible. Right? I think, am I on? Sovereignty comes in a lot of different forms. Uh, there are the evil kings whose idea of sovereignty is, I'm going to make my subjects do my will. And then there's the God type of sovereignty who says, I'm going to allow my creation to have free will. That doesn't lessen his sovereignty. His sovereignty dictated that his creation will have free will. It's kind of like as a parent of a child, we like to believe we're sovereign, um, but we allow our children free will. That doesn't lessen our sovereignty. It, sovereignty manifests itself in a lot of form. Kind of, I, I think, you know, a big misinterpretation when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart and it made it look like he was making Pharaoh do things against his own will to bring about God's plan. I, I think a better translation of that would be God allowed Pharaoh's heart back to the state where it was originally. And then whatever happened, happened. So that was sovereignty by allowing it mixed with Pharaoh's free will to bring about a result. So again, I think sovereignty can take on a lot of different forms, but it's no less sovereign. Amen. Just on a little short note, uh, you know, when you look at some of the tragic things that happen in life, in particular things like the Holocaust that took place in in Germany in the 40s. There are people that would say God directed that to the Jews. And uh, it's just simply not true that it took place in that fashion. There's some things that go on in our lives, even as individuals, that we, if, if we believe that God is sovereign and directs every activity that takes place, you are gonna begin to judge God's motives why he does what he does. I mean, judgment upon God comes when you have that type of view of the sovereignty of God. And I believe God is sovereign, but he's sovereign in this fashion, that in the midst of our turmoil and in, in the difficulties and the trials that we experience in this life, he is delivering our hearts from that in, a, in establishing eternal life in the hearts of people who believe in him, who will believe on him. And he's, he's imploring men to believe in him. And, uh, and he's sovereign in that way. Mm. He, he, he has a saving sovereignty. Glory to God. So See, these, these guys answer much better than me. So as you explained it, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man meet at a place called choice. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the ability to accept or reject. You know, and I love how Gary brought up uh, the verse about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And I think if you go look in that in Exodus, there's a number of times where it talks about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. But I believe the first time it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then after that, it says God hardened his heart. And um, something I realize is that uh, when you preach grace to a person who wants to be exalted by their works... It, their heart gets hard. And so there's a way you can define God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And we come with a, a definition of that that isn't contextual. We decide that the words God hardened Pharaoh's heart mean 
Pharaoh didn't really want to when God made it happen that way. But that's not what happened. Uh, God, through Moses, came preaching grace. And Pharaoh wanted to be exalted by his works. He wanted to be his own God. And so the more he heard that there was another guy who was God, and that this guy was God over him, the more his heart became hardened. And I think you see that in first century Israel when Jesus came. Right? Jesus came preaching the grace of God, and the pharisaical system or the Judaism in that day, their hearts were hardened to what Jesus was preaching, weren't they? So we could say Jesus hardened their heart. Now, does that mean Jesus made their hearts harden? Or does that mean Jesus preached a word that wasn't in line with what they wanted, and so they hardened their hearts to it? And see, that's what I find with grace. If you preach grace to a person who, who wants to be exalted by their works, who thinks they're getting something good from their works, their heart's going to be hardened to the grace. Because a guy like Pharaoh, who in his mind is ruling the whole universe, don't want to hear about how he ain't God. And he don't want to hear about how these other people, who he considers to be his servants, are equal with him. And so his heart became hardened to that. Right? And, and likewise with Judaism, those guys didn't want to hear what Jesus was preaching, which was that God loved the sinners. And that whether you had money or not didn't matter. Whether you had accomplishments or not didn't matter. Your social status didn't matter in the eyes of God. They didn't want to hear a guy preaching that. And so they hardened their hearts. And so what, what, the way I would look at it more with Pharaoh is that his heart was hardened to who God is. Right? He rejected who God is. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart, meaning God came and revealed himself, and Pharaoh's heart rejected that. Right? This is going to be on a different track. But um, I woke up thinking about this question, and I'm, I'm curious about your insight. And I think you guys have demonstrated that nobody's going to want to be on the panel now. <laughs> because you're... Because your answers are so deep, it's like, I wouldn't have thought of that. Today's, anyway. question, today's questions have been more deep than some yeah. of the other sessions. All right, so let's light, lighten it up, maybe. <laughs> Romans 14, uh, there's a passage that talks about the guy who, uh, I shouldn't eat this, I shouldn't drink that. And then Paul goes on to say, you know, don't, don't, do, don't eat or drink to make your, your, your brother stumble. And so I want to just uh, read and have you comment on this, because it says in Romans 14, verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine, or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. And here's the puzzling verse to me. I want your thoughts on this. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. I read that, and I think, well, why? If you see your brother caught up in a wisdom whereby he tries to please God by not doing something, you see that's the wisdom of Satan. Why wouldn't you just take that uh, and, uh, and tell him, that's a lie, that's not from God, uh, God doesn't approve of you if you don't eat meat, if you eat meat on Friday or if you drink wine on Saturday. But the verse says, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. I find that quite curious, so I'd like your comments on that. <laughs> you guys want me to go? You know what's being revealed here? That we got no business sitting up no, here. No. <laughs> Turn our chairs around. The, 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 the guests are like, these are the guys they have teaching. My goodness, we must pray for this fellowship. <laughs> um, something I do, and it's funny we just talked about this. When I, when I interpret the Bible, there's several things that I do. And as I get down the line of what I'm trying to interpret there, I'm going to interpret the historical context or the context of the letter. Something I do with that verse is I don't go and make a universal truth out of that. I consider that verse in light of what Paul's speaking to. And so at the beginning of Romans, you have to understand that the whole reason why the letter to the Romans was written was because the Jewish people had been exiled from Rome. And a new emperor had come, and he had issued an edict that was going to allow the Jewish people all to come back into Rome. And so there was going to now become this dynamic where there was Jewish people and Gentile people in a church together, right? Now... Those are two different cultures, and they have two different backgrounds, right? And so the question would come up big time, what about eating meat to idols? Because to Gentile people, all the meat had been sacrificed to idols. But to the Jewish people, they'd been taught 
like it was life or death not to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols, right? That was like a heavy, heavy thing. And so the foundation for what Paul is talking about is the foundation of there being Jewish brothers and sisters coming together with Gentile brothers and sisters and how are they going to get along with each other without being a problem for one another. And so one of the things he's talking about there is um, with respect to that. And so what he's talking about is we know that whether you eat meat sacrificed to idols or not means nothing. Means nothing. Okay? Um, it's not about whether it's been sacrificed to idols or not, but it's about what's in the heart. And so these Gentile guys who were never brought up in that system, that faith is real easy for them. It doesn't matter. Okay? But for these Jewish guys, man, you've got to remember, this is right after Christ. Who knows how long it might take for them to be free? So I don't know that he's necessarily speaking of don't declare that we're crucified to the flesh and all the things that come from that. But I think he's saying the way you're going to do that isn't by flaunting it in their faces. Right? So just because I know I'm free and I know I can eat meat, I'm not going to now bring all the meat out in the midst of the fellowship I have with these Jewish brethren who've been taught they're going to die if they do that and I'm just going to sit there and eat it. <laughs> right? So I think he's talking about that. He's not talking about whether or not we're going to preach the truth. Right? So if I'm sitting with a, a brother and we're talking, I'll share the truth with him. But I'm not going to share the truth with him by just doing what I know I'm free to do in his face whether he knows it or not, right? Because then that'll be a stumbling block for him, right? If he thinks, well, that guy's doing it, I can do it. But his heart isn't free yet, and he goes to eat it, it doesn't matter if God doesn't condemn him, his own heart will condemn him. And so that's what Paul's talking about there. Whatever you do, do from faith and not from sin. Faith is a persuasion. So he's telling the Gentile guys, you guys, if you're free in your heart and you know you're free to eat this meat, listen, consider your Jewish brothers that maybe still need to experience some freedom in that area through the truth and don't do that right in front of them. Have faith with, behind closed doors with you and God. Right? It's kind of, so he's considering the hearts of the Jewish guys because he's understanding these guys got some legalism to be unwound. And it, it kind of goes back to Acts. I'm reminded of Acts where uh, James says, and they're talking about, what are they going to tell the Gentile people? And he says, we're not going to put them under the law, only that they not eat things with blood or strangulation and to avoid fornication. Do you remember those things? He wasn't saying that's a law that you're going to do to be accepted to God. He was talking about some of the things that would be a big stumbling block to the Jewish church. Right? And so what it would have been a big stumbling block to the Jewish church would have been eating meat sacrificed to idols, fornicating in the temple. Fornication, in that sense, is not talking about premarital sex. Okay? That's not what fornication is. When Paul talks about fornication in the Bible, he's talking about the fact that the Gentiles would go into a temple and they would fornicate with the temple priestesses. That was part of their worship. And so when he talks about avoid fornication, that's what he's talking about. When he talks about avoid uh, eating meat with blood or that have been come by strangulation, he's talking about things the Jewish people held dear. And so he's using that so that this church can integrate peacefully. This body can come together peacefully. Now, through the preaching of Christ at the front, the Jewish guys will be set free eventually. And when they have faith, then it, it's fine. Right? But I, it's like, if I know I'm free to drink beer... And not to be a drunkard, but dr just to drink beer. But I have a good friend who thinks it's a mortal sin to drink beer. I'm not going to try to teach him it's not a mortal sin by getting drunk with him. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? Through the course of walking with him, I'll share enough about the cross. He'll get a revelation of what that means, and then he'll be free. And then when he's free, I'll have a beer with him if he wants to have one. And I want to have one. Does that make sense? But I'm not going to try to force my liberality on him, right? I'm not going to say, ah, oh, man, we're free, uh, you know, like that. Because that's not going to compute to him. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to him about it through the course of our lives. He'll get a revelation, and if he's free in that area, then he can have a beer if he wants, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Guys, just so you understand what I'm saying, um, you don't ever have to have a beer if you don't want one, Okay? If beer is a problem for you, then don't drink beer, okay? It's that simple. There's things that are a problem for me, and I stay away from them because I realize they're a problem for me. So please understand the context of what I just said. And if you don't, speak up now. Or forever hold your peace. <laughs> so, uh, actually, 
Yeah. What he said. Uh. <laughs> no, but you bring up an interesting point, Tom, about, and we have a friend like that who's been saved for 30 years or whatever, but he's still thinking he needs to please God by things he does or doesn't do. And so Greg talks about context back in that day, why that scripture was relevant back in that context. But the context today of grace would be more in line with what you said. If you have a friend who's free, maybe not at a grace-filled church, still thinking he needs to behave in a certain way or do certain things, then it would probably be appropriate in that setting to say, hey, let me tell you about the grace of God and, and what real freedom, peace, and rest looks like. And, and real freedom and peace and rest, this is difficult for us to hear. And I realize some people aren't going to like this in grace. If you're really free, you can leave it, is what Paul's saying there. If you're really free, you'll be more concerned about the condemnation that could come against the other person's heart than your own liberality to do something you like. I know that's a painful thing for us to hear. That doesn't mean if we don't do that, that we should be ashamed. I'm just talking about what real freedom will look like when it has its end work. Okay, When it has its end work, you'll be more concerned about the heart of the other person than you will about your own liberality. And you'll be more thinking of their heart. right? And so, Thomas, I would agree with what Gary said. Paul isn't saying don't preach them the gospel. I just think he's saying you're not going to do it by pounding a big plate of meat in front of them and being like, ah, look what I can do. <laughs> you, you know? Yeah, I, I was thinking that um, Paul is saying don't try to correct someone's misguided behavior by showing them they are free and they don't have to do what they are trying to abstain from doing. In other words, Jesus didn't come to correct our behavior. Yeah. He came to give his life. So would you in that context be giving a person... Uh, would you be exposing that person to life by urging them to do something against their conscience? <laughs> you no, would not. Just bear with them and let the Spirit effortlessly educate them and free them. Amen. And that's the best way to say it. That's the best way to say it. I got the answer along the way. <laughs> <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? I mean, Paul knew he was free, but there was times where Paul would go and hang out with his Jewish brethren, and he... I don't want to say conform because he didn't adopt a persuasion, but he went and got along with their festivals to fit in just so he could be with them to hope to win the more. What did Paul say? I become all things to all people that I might win the more to God. And so out of my great liberality, and I know I'm not condemned, from that position of faith, I can go interact with people in a number of different environments and be happy there and get along with them in whatever place they're at. And in that place, I can meet them and be with them and rejoice with them. I mean, I, I do it all the time at Mardi Gras. I mean, please don't take this the wrong way. This comes up a lot. But, you know, you know how they want to bus in all the people during Mardi Gras? And they want to stand out there and they want to evangelize and they want to get in and all the people who are out there at Mardi Gras. And listen, this isn't to shame them or to say that's the wrong way around it. But um, I don't really think that's an effective form of evangelism. Um, what would be much more effective is kind of like what I, I, I do when I go down there. I go down there just to be around the people and to enjoy the people. Now, through the course of enjoying the people and being with them where they're at, conversations get struck up. You begin talking about things. You begin sharing things. They want to know what you do. They want to know why you're, you know, all those kinds of things. Listen, the people I go down there and just hang out with, where I'm like, oh, man, trying to catch beads. I'm laughing with them. Oh, man, I love New Orleans. What do you do? Oh, man, I'm a preacher. What? <laughs> Next thing you know, I was just a guy hanging out with them. Wasn't trying to convert them. Wasn't trying to tell them they're in sin. Just, I was just being with them, enjoying life with them. And then from that foundation, when that would come up, listen, a conversation could come up. And then there could be a foundation from where I could talk to them. But we just want to stand on the side of the road with the booth and our sign. Listen, a lot of, this is shocking for a lot of Christians. A lot of people down at the Mardi Gras are already saved. They are. Being at Mardi Gras isn't a sign that you're going to hell. <laughs> Being at Mardi Gras isn't a sign that you're filled with the devil. And I think sometimes we think, all those people need to be saved. <laughs> you see, so in my liberality... I go down there and I'm just with the people. 
But I don't go try to tell other people that they got to do that too. Does that make any sense? But I love how you said it, Thomas. That was, that was great. Uh, we, it's about the conscience. And that's why it says um, it matters not what you do, but it matters the heart behind it. So if your heart is of faith, meaning you see that you've been crucified to a life defined by the flesh, then you're free. But if your heart is still filled with the flesh, then your conscience will condemn you, right? And then that's no good for the person, right? They'll walk away all night feeling ashamed, full of guilt. doesn't matter if God feels that way. They feel that way. Listen, God wasn't ashamed of Adam, and Adam felt ashamed, right? <laughs> Glory to God. Jay, you guys passed the mic back there? Hi, Jay. How's it going? How are you? Good, good. Hi, this is totally different. Um, but I, I've sensed uh, uh, over the years that people, um, this is completely different, like I was saying, that they think if they say that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing on earth, that he never felt the pain. Like, I feel like they, to say he was fully God, he was fully human, they don't understand that. And they feel like he never, he never understood the pain, like, just because he was God. They, they want to say he was the only human when he was here. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad what we talked about Wednesday and Monday and everything was really good. Uh, nobody, I'm sure not everybody, not everybody heard it, but I kind of just want to expand that. Yeah, he, you know, he is the word, and he, he, when he came, um, you know, he knew what he, he came to do. I mean, he, he, I don't want to say too much stuff that, my, my, you know, people might take it the wrong way and get offended. But like when I was four years old, I understood the concept of God. So for me, it's, it's hard for me to say, you know, to agree that he never understood what he, what, you know, when he was on earth, even as a, a child, he didn't understand what he was doing. He came to earth to do, you know, the fact. Because he, I mean, like we, like we said, through one man, Adam, you know, we became of the other mindset. And then through him, he crushed it. He experienced it and crushed it, like, you know, on the cross. Yeah. And so he knew what he was doing. He, I mean, I'll tell you, the, the pain of knowing that you, you've set your children free, there's a freedom, and the children, your children are not experiencing that. I mean, that's, that's a greater pain than you experience in the darkness. I'll yeah. tell you that much. And then for him to come on the cross, I mean, to come and experience that and then crush it, I'll tell you, that's great pain. But I think people were really just sort of like, oh, yeah, I can't, I can't grasp the concept that he was fully God and fully human. But he was. He knew what he was doing all the whole time. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And it's, we talk about this a lot, but human beings, we struggle to see the many sides of one thing. And we get focused on one side of a thing, and then we just get inside of that. The only thing you ever want to just get focused on is Christ and him crucified. In fact, Paul said, I preach nothing, I, I claim to know nothing before you except Christ and him crucified. That's the only thing you want to get focused on. But a lot of times, as the, the church worldwide, we'll get focused on um, Jesus as God, fully divine, which is true. But then in our focusing on that, we eliminate the, the fact that he was fully human, right? And as being fully human, he tasted and felt everything we felt without believing the lies about it right? So it says Jesus is a compassionate high priest who tasted our weakness. He felt our infirmity. Yet in that place of feeling our weakness and our pain and our infirmity, he never believed the lie. One of the reasons he didn't believe the lie is like Jacinta says, he knew what he came to do. And so he was reminded of that by the Holy Spirit. He had full union with the Spirit. And so the Spirit and the Father could talk to him. But Jesus experienced everything we experienced, our weakness, the feeling of infirmity, he felt fear press in on him, but in that place where he felt the lie and the darkness pressing in on him, he never believed the lie. He rejected it, right? I don't think we understand this, but death and darkness speaks a silent word to our hearts. And that feeling of weakness, that feeling of infirmity, it speaks a silent word to our heart. And that silent word that it speaks is a lie. And that lie is trying to persuade us we've been orphaned in the earth. This weakness and this death and this infirmity I feel is the proof I'm an orphan. I've been forsaken by God. Now, we all felt the same weakness of Jesus, and then we believed that we were orphans. We had been forsaken. And then we set about trying to give ourselves life. 
Well, Jesus comes as a human being, knowing why he came. He was taught in the scriptures by God and the Holy Spirit. And when he gets up on the cross, he feels the full weight of death and our weakness and infirmity pressing in on him, trying to tell him the lie that he's an orphan. This death you're dying means you're an orphan in the earth. God's forsaken you. Jesus rejected that lie. He said, no, I'm not. I'm not an orphan in the earth. I haven't been forsaken by God. Watch this. Abba, into your hands, I commit my life, right? And so it, it's, it's, you have to understand the whole aspect of Jesus there and, and understand all the different nuances being revealed. There's things about Jesus. Jesus came to reveal the Father, so you can look at all the accounts of Jesus and only see things that are pertaining to God. This is God. And talking about God. But Jesus also came as the Son of Man. And you can read the Scriptures from the perspective of seeing the truth about your life with God in the face of Jesus. So He, re he come and reveal man for who they really are. And He come and reveal God for who God really is. And so He's revealing multiple things simultaneously. Right? And that's one of the reasons why Paul's like, Oh, the wisdom and majesty of God. How does He reveal a hundred million things simultaneously? about all these different aspects, right? Does that make sense? And so, guys, one of the most powerful things in the Bible is that John says, no man had seen the Father but Jesus. He came to bring him out where we could see him for who he really is. When Adam sinned and he was naked, he thought the Father rejected him and forsook him. So we saw the Father as a guy who forsakes when he finds somebody in sin. That's not who the Father really is. So Jesus came to bring the Father out of the darkness where we could see Him. How did He do that? He became a man with sin. And in that place of being a man with sin, He revealed the Father for what the Father will do when He finds a man in sin. And what did the Father do? Did He abandon Jesus when Jesus was in the grave? No! He came and raised Jesus up from the dead. So He revealed the Father. But then He also revealed our lives to us. Right? That we weren't forsaken by Abba. That Abba was never ashamed of us. You see? And so that's how the thing works. And I'm glad you asked that question because there's another question on here that will just kind of lead into that if you guys don't mind because it pertains to this topic. But somebody online, um, let's see, where is it at? What do they say here? It says, in light of the message Sunday and what you said about Jesus having felt weakness just like us, do you think it's possible that Jesus felt forsaken but never believed he was forsaken? And so the way I would, yeah, it's a great question. And the way I would interpret that question is, could Jesus feel what it's like to have the feeling of I'm forsaken without believing it? Can there be a distinction between feeling something and believing it? Yeah. Right? Can there be a distinction there? And so the question, I'm going to read it again. In light of the message Sunday and what you said about Jesus having felt weakness just like us, do you think it's possible that Jesus felt forsaken but never believed he was forsaken? And uh, well, I'll, Gary, you can kind of jump in to start if you want. I think Gary's got some good insight into uh, that question. Yeah, Greg and I have been discussing this issue for uh, at length. Um, and when he preached the message on being f or feeling forsaken, it, it kind of dawned on me that Adam never asked God after he fell why have you forsaken me? Because the wisdom of Adam that he had, his own wisdom, um, says, if you sin, God forsakes you. That's what he knew about God. So you never heard Adam, while he's hiding in the bushes, saying, why have you forsaken me? In his mind, he knew why God forsook him, because he sinned. Now Jesus, on the other hand, knows God. He has the wisdom of God. So, in his mind, when he felt forsaken, it, it caused a conflict in his brain. I know this about God. I know God will never forsake me. So, there's a disconnect here. So, the disconnect caused him to cry out, why am I feeling forsaken, basically? So, but he never... And, and this is the important distinction, and, and this is 
where it applies to us. And it, it, it kind of goes back, one of my relevantly favorite scriptures is 2 Corinthians 4, when Paul's talking about we're troubled but not distressed. I'm per we're perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted but not forsaken. We're cast down but not destroyed. What he's saying is this is the situation we're in, but we're not believing. I'm not in despair because I don't believe these things. I don't believe... I I might be persecuted, but I know I'm not forsaken. Yeah. So Jesus at that moment was obviously being persecuted, but he never believed. He may have felt a certain thing, but he never believed for a minute that he was forsaken. And it kind of applies to our daily lives. There are many times we, felt, we feel pressed in on. And, and again, it's something Greg and I have discussed. As Christians, as grace-filled Christians, sometimes we have the mistaken assumption that we're never supposed to feel forsaken. We're never supposed to feel like God has left us. But we can look to Jesus and say, it's okay, as long as we don't believe these things. Because if you start believing that you're forsaken, you're going to do something in your own strength to get back in God's good graces. If Jesus truly believed he was forsaken, he might have decided, you know what, I'm out of here, I'm off the cross, I'll take up matters into my own hand. So it's okay to feel pressed in on. It's okay to feel certain things, but it should never affect your belief system, never make your spirit-filled belief system turn into an atom belief system of, I'm forsaken, I need to do something to fix this. That's the big difference. And don't ever feel, for lack of a better word, guilty for feeling certain things because you're in good company with the one on the cross. But there's a big disconnect between feeling something and believing something. And that's where Jesus was. He may have felt something, but never ever believed that he was actually forsaken. Because, again, knowing what he knew about God, I mean, his own name, Emmanuel, means God with us. So he's not going to go against his own <laughs> name. Knowing what he knew about God, there was this disconnect. And so it was okay to cry out, but not believe what he was at that moment actually crying out. I, so, so that's the big difference. Sorry, I, I, if you, I hope you don't mind if I add something to this. Well, hold on. Oh. Let's, are you going to add to what oh, he just said? Sorry, go ahead. No, no, are you going to add to what he just said? Yeah. Or are you going to take it somewhere else? He was gonna, she was going to share something. Okay, and yeah, I want to stay on this. If you want to go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to. No, no, go ahead. I want to stay on this topic, though. Okay, yeah. So, with this topic, um, I know this is going to sound weird. I don't, I'm not saying it out of, because when people get offended, they take it the wrong way, but that's not what I'm saying. But, but when I was four on, when I heard the gospel until 2007, um, like, I never felt forsaken. I'll tell you. Um, so what I'm trying to say, and then until t after 2007, um, yeah, long story, I'm not going to get too much into that, but what I'm trying to say is that I believe that he took the concept on to crush it. He, I feel like on the cross, I don't know, and I, even with that, it's not to say if, if you're feeling uh, forsaken, you, if you, should, if you, you should feel ashamed. What I'm trying to say is that he took that at that cross because I thinking about thinking back on my experience. I see that. Um, sorry, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I feel like I don't want to say the wrong things, but I, you know, he took it, he came to crush it at the cross. I felt like he at the cross is when he uh, took it on to show us how that that thinking makes us feel. And for me, I feel like he crushed it there, and that's where I can come and say. This is freedom. They here at the cross, like even Paul, he mentions this. Uh, what I want to do, I can't do. But what I don't want to do, I, I do. You know, and he said, "But Christ, you know, the cross." He he mentions, "But there's freedom in Christ." See, that's what happened at the cross. That he took that very thing, cried it out, and then a moment he crushed it. Yeah. And that's where I could come and find freedom. That when I'm feeling that way, 
There is freedom because this is the, the, the baseline, the foundation of truth, the foundation that he crushed it there. And the veil was torn. And I could come now face to face and see into his eyes. I could sit on his lap. And this is where the separation of feeling forsaken will stop. It's not just, I feel forsaken. He felt forsaken. Great. It's the foundation of knowing that he crushed it there at the cross. And for me to fellowship with that and know this is the truth. Because he was God. He knew himself. But for us, we have to come and fellowship at the cross and say, he crushed that. And the reason why I, say, I said back in 2007 how I started feeling that, because before that, um, when I was four or five, I, when people would speak, I, would, I, would, I, I knew God. And then uh, people in the church, they would speak about him differently. So I said, just close my ears. But back in 2007 is when I said, open my ears to hear. So once I started to hear what they were saying, that's when it felt. I wanted to fully experience that. And then, so that's when it felt like, you know, you, you're feeling forsaken by what people are saying about him. Like, you know, so that's why I wanted to make that point. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the manifold wisdom of God. I got a four-part series back there about forsaken, and the whole foundation is from what you just said. He came to crush the lie that we were ever forsaken. But Christ is the manifold wisdom of God. So there's much more being revealed in Jesus crying out that than just that aspect of it. There's other aspects of deliverance that come. Jesus couldn't be our high priest unless he tasted what we tasted. And so what, what Gary's saying there is that the way death presses in on a person, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when death presses in on a human being, it carries with it a weight and a lie that you're forsaken, right? And so Jesus, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he feels the weight of the lie, as the Son of Man, again, you have to discern God and the Son of Man. So as the Son of Man, Jesus knows God never forsakes, but now he's carrying the full weight of the death and the death is trying to tell him he's forsaken. So he feels pressed in on by the lie. And one of the things he does in that place, because he actually knows Abba, is he engages with Abba about what he feels through the spirit of truth. He starts talking with Abba about what he's going through through the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth comes and discerns his thoughts there. From the carnal mind to the spiritual mind. It's the spirit of truth that gave birth to the truth inside of Jesus. And so what I see there is Jesus as the Son of Man shows us that in that place, He felt what it feels like to feel forsaken, right? Death makes you feel a certain thing. He felt what that lie feels like. But in that place, He didn't believe it. He reached out to God in the sense of, Abba, what's happening? What's going on? As the Son of Man, talking to Abba. And Abba sorted out what he thought. And Abba led him into the place where he li lied down in the tender green grass. Abba led him beside the still waters of grace. I mean, if you read Psalm 23, that's Jesus. And so Jesus is talking about Abba having led him somewhere. And where did he lead him? He led him in the place from where he felt the full weight of death, and that death was trying to tell him he was an orphan. And then Abba led him into the place where he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I do not lack. He leadeth me beside the still waters of grace. He come and reveal to me that my strength is not found in this flesh that's perishing. My strength is found in God and His grace. He caused me to lie down in the tender green grass by revealing this to me. He maketh me a table. That's all Jesus talking. Right? And so Jesus talks about Abba being with Him on the cross and discerning the thoughts and intents of His heart and rejecting the lie and strengthening the truth inside of Him. Right? If we don't see Jesus as being fully human and needing everything that came out of him to have come from God as a son of man, then we're missing it. And that leaves us thinking, we just need to know. And we're just going to do this because we know. No, no, no. Everything that came out of Jesus as the son of man that was good came from Abba. Just, I mean, in the same way that happened when he walked the earth, it happened the same way on the cross. What was the good thing that came out of Jesus when he was on the cross? He resisted the temptation to believe he was forsaken. How did he resist the temptation to believe he was forsaken? Abba. How did he resist the temptation to believe that he was an orphan in the earth? The spirit of truth. Right? And so they were there with him, talking with him. It's like that uh, Mumford and Sons song. I think I've sang it before in one of the messages. Death is at your doorstep, but it cannot steal your innocence. 
It cannot steal your substance. Right? You are not alone in this. You are not alone in this. Together we will stand and we'll hold your hand. Hold your hand. And listen, that's Abba in the Spirit talking with Jesus. When he's hanging on the cross and death is at his doorstep. You are not alone in this. They know what that feels like. They're telling him, we're with you, man. We're holding your hand. Right? They were coming against the lie. The spirit of truth always comes against the lie. The lie came against Jesus. The full weight of that lie came against him when he was clothed in death. And then Abba in the spirit came to him as the son of man, clothed in death, and strengthened him to reject the lie that he was forsaken and to cry out, Abba is my shepherd, I do not lack. Right? And then Psalm 23 goes into place. And so it's, it's, it's beautiful to connect Jesus as God coming, knowing what he was going to crush and crushing it like he does in Luke 2, where he just speaks the word to crush the lie. But there's also Jesus as the Son of Man who feels that infirmity and then looks to Abba for strength in the midst of feeling that infirmity because that reveals to us, it brings forth a faith in us that when we feel that way, we engage with Abba the same way he did. Right? Mo? I was just going to say, <clears throat> you know, if you're going to be on a panel like this, it's good to have Greg and Gary next to you because they say everything you wanted to say before you say it so that's good it's good <laughs> what's that I'm not gonna sing and I don't even know who Mumford and Sons is I can tell you that <laughs> but uh you know getting back to the original question you know uh you know does God can can God feel forsaken and yet know that he's not forsaken. Well, just think about your own life. Have you ever felt forsaken? I don't think there's a person in this room that has never felt forsaken. But guess what? You know you're not, don't you? Yeah. You know you're not. I, I also... Don't leave, Mo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Exit stage left. Mo's going to the bathroom. <laughs> I thought he was feeling forsaken. Listen, you guys, it's okay. He's not mic'd up. He's not mic'd up. Sometimes, you know, people get out of the meeting and they forget they're mic'd up and they go in the bathroom. <laughs> You've never done that, Andrew? No, no. No, I think it's interesting, and I could be wrong on this, um, but I think that's the only time in, in the gospel accounts that Jesus says God and not Father. My God, why have you forsaken me? I, every other time he refers to God, it's as his Father. I could be wrong on that. I hope not. Um, the weight of death was so heavy on him at that moment, he may not have even felt sonship at that moment. And again, getting back to what Mo said, how many times have we gone through a situation where maybe we're not feeling like we're the beloved Son of God at that moment. But again, it's not believing that is the catch, and that's where Jesus was. And like Greg said, I think at that moment when the weight was so heavy on him, that's when God reminded him, I am your shepherd. You are exactly as you ought to be. Mm. And I think that's when peace came over him and he realized. Because when you realize that Psalm 22 and 23 goes back to David, who was a man after God's own heart. So, obviously at that moment when David was feeling, he was feeling forsaken, he was feeling persecuted, but again, his thought process went right into, the Lord is my shepherd, I am exactly as I ought to be. So, you, you got two examples, old and new, of a feeling not becoming a belief. Yeah. And that's important. Amen. That, that, is, that is very important. And that's, that's the thing, because so many times we let our feelings dictate a truth to us or a belief. And what's important there is that the feeling gets circumvented with the truth so that negative feeling doesn't become a lie that dwells in your heart. 
right? And there's a lot of power in that. And interesting enough, the reason why it says David is a man after God's own heart is because David is a type in the shadow of Jesus. And Jesus was going to come, and who was he going to be? The only man who'd seen the heart of the Father, right? So Jesus come as a man after God's own heart, right? And he finds himself in that place on the cross. Billy. You know, um, uh, what a feast this has been this morning. My heart is filled with... <clears throat> Two, two scriptures come to mind that what we see is not important. It's what we don't see that's important. Mm -hmm. And also the other one was, um, he's the peace that passes all my understanding. And that we really are separate and we live in this world, but we're not of it. Yeah. And, and that, what a treasure that is. That's priceless. Amen. Yeah, I mean, freedom to see that you're not of this world. Uh, Your life isn't of this world. Your life is of Elohim. Uh, yeah, we're not world. under the circumstances. Right, right. Does anybody else want to jump in? Brandy? Um, I just thought that it was interesting that you said about God, um, Jesus saying, um, my God. And immediately I thought of the prodigal son and how he came, he spent so much time away from his father that whenever he came back, he didn't come back as a son, he came back as a servant. And so, I don't know, just immediately I, I got that connection, so I thought that was um, interesting that you pointed that out. Um, but that, I, th I think that um, when Greg said about... Um, I think I think you said about the negative feeling. Um, when you have negative feelings, you can come up with your own wisdom, and then that's how a lie is planted. And um, I think I don't know. I got a re revelation from that. That in the in a moment of crisis, when you have that choice, you have a choice to either handle it yourself. And, and then it does the damage by planting a lie in your own heart or cry out to God. And yep. then God can, like Jacinta keeps using that word, crush what is opposing you, you know. And um, I also thought it was interesting about him saying, I have no lack. I just imagined Jesus when he's up on the cross and feeling all the pain and all the weight of the world, if God gave him a wisdom that made him not come down off the cross and say, oh, well, I, gotta, I don't have all I need to hang on the cross right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> let me go out and get what I need, and I'll come back to this later. <laughs> so, I don't know. It was just like a revelation about procrastinating to me that, you know, that if God's calling you to do something, sometimes you can think, oh, well, I don't have all that I need to do that right now, you know, and um, or I'll do it whenever it's easier or would I have more support or whatever. And so anyhow, yeah, Gordon, I thought that was I like, interesting. And I like how you said what you say there, because so many times when we experience a traumatic experience, our first reaction isn't to sit with Abba and say, what does this mean? What's going on, God? Am I the son? Am I a daughter? Why? Our first reaction isn't that. Our first reaction tends to be to run down the road with our own conclusions. Yeah. We'll jump to things like, well, did I give my tithe last month? Is this happening to me because I haven't given my tithe? I mean, we, we, we come up with all these conclusions that get us to think that we're separated from God. We, we decide what these things mean. We decide what they mean about us. We decide what they mean about other people. We decide what they mean about God and what he thinks of us. And we run down the road with all those conclusions. And we don't just sit with God in that place. Because when we feel trauma and pain, our inclination is to try to fix it. Right? But what we see in Jesus is that he didn't try to fix the pain. He didn't try to bring himself peace about the pain. He didn't even come up with his own conclusions. He immediately talked to God and wanted God to come and tell him what's going on there. Right? Kind of like God came to the first Adam after Adam concluded all these things about God. And God comes to Adam and says, who told you, man? Who told you? 
And so what can happen is, guys, what, what I see God has done inside of me, and I say he's given birth to it. I don't make an intellectual decision. But I see he's brought something forth in me through the spirit of his son that when traumatic experiences come against me, I don't make conclusions and I don't try to fix them. I find myself immediately sitting there talking with God about what I feel, just like Jesus d does in that psalm. I find myself reaching out to him about whatever confusion I feel. I find myself reaching out to him about the pain I feel. And if, even if I'm angry, I find myself reaching out. Because if i got a perverted view of the sovereignty of God, I'm going to think, God, let this happen to me. Which is the same as he did it to me. And if I feel that, listen, if I don't talk to him about that feeling, I'm going to run down the road with it. And I'm going to say, I'm separated from God. I've got to take care of myself. But if I reach out to God, he'll come and say, Greg, who told you that I have control over that situation? Who told you I let this happen? Show me the scripture, Greg. See, God come and question my answers when I stopped coming to my own conclusions in trauma and I just stopped and said, Daddy, what's happening, man? And I let him come and give me answers. Right? It changes the whole thing. And so I love what you said there because that's one of the most powerful things. When trauma in this world comes against us, we tend to do like the first Adam, try to clothe ourselves with our conclusions, our figuring, our actions. But when we, the life of the sun can be born in us and trauma comes against us, our first reaction is, Abba! Right? And we rest. We don't come to conclusions. We don't try to clothe ourselves. But we sit and talk with Abba. He comes and discerns the thoughts and intents of our hearts. He removes the lies that were coming against us. He strengthens the truth. He clothes our hearts. Right? With the truth. With the spirit of truth. The word is a sharp like a two-edged sword. Thomas. Uh, I'm sure everybody's enjoying the, the truth being stirred up in your, your heart right now. I am. Uh, you know, we, we've all heard, heard the expression, I killed two birds with one stone, right? And maybe for someone listening, you know, another part of the world, they've never heard that. But when you think about it, the wisdom of Satan boils down to two lies. One lie, or one bird, is the lie about God. The other lie, the other bird, is a lie about man. And so when you hear that expression growing up, you think, well, that's impossible. You can't kill two birds with one stone. You have to pick one or the other, but you can't kill them both with one stone. Well, that's what God did through Christ on the cross. He killed two birds with one stone. Now, who's the stone? Jesus. Who's the rock? Jesus. Yeah, that's good. And he, and he did it simultaneously. <laughs> Boom. You know? God dropped it like it was hot. <laughs> For all you young people. <laughs> uh, glory to God. Well, we've been here a while. You guys want some more or are you done? The same starts in the did, do either one of you guys have something you want to add that's off the cuff or uh, pertaining to this or whatever? Anything you feel? I would like to share one thing. I, I don't know what was, had me just going around in my mind earlier, but this week. But uh, I was thinking about, like, when you're raising a child, people actually have philosophies on how to raise their children. And I think everybody does. And uh, so I, I was thinking about kind of the modern mentality that we to give our children everything. And it don't matter whether they're doing good or doing bad. I'm going to just lavish all these things on my child. And as a result of that, they're going to see the love that I have for them, and they're going to uh, be the person that they need to be as a result of it. And I can tell you that that don't work. <laughs> it absolutely don't work. No, there's another philosophy. There's another philosophy that says, my child is going to work for every nickel they get. I'm not going to give them a damn thing. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they're going to learn how to survive. They're going to learn how to, uh, you know, be the master of their own destiny. They're going to learn how to be resourceful because nobody's given them anything. And then somebody else will say, well, you know, I can see both sides. I want to give to my child. And I also recognize that they have to work for a living, so I'm going to teach them responsibility. So they try and blend the things and, and try and make it work. And uh, 
I was thinking about my life when I was, when I was a, a kid, you know. My dad was, I saw grace in my father, and I saw, uh, I saw some rigidness and some instruction. I had a great daddy, okay? But I want to tell you something. Even though I saw both things in him, and he was a great daddy, the thing that won my heart to him was the fact that when I was 17, no, I was 18 years old, I got in this horrible automobile accident, accident drunk as can be, me and a friend of mine, and uh, I believe that my daddy was going to kill me when this thing occurred, but I, I had to go to the police station, and uh, I, I was injured, and uh, he came in, and he looked at me, and I could see the flames in his eyes. He was very, very upset with me over what I had done, but the minute he saw that I was hurt, his countenance completely changed, and he said, son, don't worry about this, it's over, you learned your lesson. And I'm gonna tell you, I never heard one negative word from my mother or father after that accident. They never even brought that accident up to me. And uh, I was just thinking about how what wins the hearts of men is a sincere, deep-rooted love that you find in someone. And that's what we see in Jesus. We see the fact that he loved us and gave himself for us. And, and when, you, when your life becomes rooted in that reality, everything changes. Because that is who God is. That all the fullness of God dwells in him in bodily form. And we can see the true heart of God in that one who, who gave himself for us. I don't know what would cause me to be thinking about these things, but I just wanted to share that. Glory to God. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Phil. Guys, we have a long-standing, I don't want to say rule, but if you've had enough, man, you ain't got to wait for us. You're free. No one's going to judge you for getting up. If you make a ruckus over there on the way out, glory to God. Um, I, I just want to say that some of the things that come to me, you know, I, I know God gives them to me just to hold on to them, just to ponder them, not to go and speak it out, you know, because I know it can like turn things upside down. But I want y'all to know, I really feel freedom to speak my heart here and, and to and, and to be naked and vulnerable in front of you guys about these things. Um, so I, I, I thank all of you for this. Glory to God, man. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> hey, and I feel the same way, man, around you and in this church. That's one of the reasons why I love this church is because of that, that feeling of vulnerability with one another, you know? Jim. I just want to say to Lisa, the reason her daughter text her is because she's done the work of being a good mother. Yeah. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody hand, uh, got a mic back there? Hi. I, um, I'm back from Kentucky. I came here before I left. And I just want to thank this church because they helped me real good before I left going to Kentucky because I was homeless. And they really reach out to me, and I appreciate that. And I'm here back on bad terms again. My daughter tried to kill herself, and I had to come back to be with her. Plus, I had to come back to have a rod put in my spine, which I haven't done yet. And I just want to thank y'all, which I'm going through bad times right now, but I'm here. And I thank God for that. You know, We're having a little hard times because it just cleaned my bank account out because we just got our apartment and furnished it. But I'm having a lot of trouble with her, and I'm trying to get her to come to God, but she's 35, and it's hard, you know. 
but I'm, I'm struggling right now, and I just wanted to thank y'all for being here because I was over at the gas station trying to get money to feed us today, and um, I turned and saw the church, and I saw the cars. I said, I remember going there, and I just walked over here and started talking to the ladies, and right now I feel great. You know? And glory to God, like, we happen to have food here. <laughs> today uh, yeah I God. feel I just feel I mean I feel real good and I thank God that he directed me back this way what's your daughter's name her name is Letitia Letitia mm -hmm. do you mind if I pray real quick sure father I just thank you for Letitia I just thank you Lord that even though man she she seems to be in a place where the darkness is overcoming her that you're not anxious about the darkness I just thank you father that uh Man, you see how great the light is that you have in yourself and, and that you're shining that light, the, the light of your adoration for Letitia in her heart, even in the midst of the darkness, even if she can't see it, even if her heart's veiled right now, that you can see what, what needs to happen in her heart. You can see what needs to happen for the veil to be removed. I thank you, Father, for your faithfulness towards Letitia. I thank you that you'll never turn your back on her, that you'll never leave her alone, that you'll always be working to influence her heart unto your love and your grace. I just thank you, Father, that you can uh, give, give eyes to her mother to, to see this same thing. That while she can feel a groaning to see her daughter clothed upon with life, that that groaning won't turn into despair. And that despair won't turn into fear, Father. But that she'll be filled with, with just a peace about the situation. That she'll just have eyes to see you working in her daughter's heart. That she'll have eyes to see you working to save her daughter. And that she'll see that... Uh, that you're with her daughter, even in the darkness, and she'll find anxiety leave and any fear leave, and she'll find a great hope and a peace come upon her in this situation. I just thank you, Lord, that if uh, there be anything that this dear woman can do to come alongside her daughter that she hasn't thought of, that you animate her with, with that truth, that you bring forth the words in her mouth, if there any, be anything to be said by a human, that you give her the words, that you give her the compassion that you have, that you fill her with your love and your strength, and that her daughter can experience you through her. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. All right, guys. You guys have a great day. We love you guys. Give yourselves a hand. You rock.